before online, before spamming Twitter, before all this other stuff, people went on the street and did it, right? Uh, it's been 26 years. I've traded I've traded everything, Forex, micro caps, big caps. The reason I think a lot of people say trading is like a business, trade like a business, is because when you're in business for yourself, you make a lot of mistakes and you have to keep taking punches to the face and figure out the right way to do things. And the same thing happens in trading, right? You're, you're wrong more often than you're right. Those were the strategies that really have moved forward. Any kind of short situation is where I want people to be like, no, this company's overvalued. I love hearing that because yes, it might be. And I, I'm in accounting. I can definitely give you the calculation on that. Like when I when I, when Tesla went from two hundred fifty dollars to two thousand dollars in that <laughs> two year span, yeah, I could have sh not predicted the final outcome, but I was able to see how short slows were piling in and how at $400 was too expensive and at $600 was too expensive and $900 was too expensive. Forex was very popular for us in 2008 onward because before the stock market was fully recovered, mm -hmm. trading currency seemed to be like the liquid thing to do that couldn't really uh. hurt you that much, right? Our next guest is a trading veteran who's been in the market since the dot-com bubble in 2000s. His name is Marcin, aka Chinner. Chinner's career began at the Roxy, one of Vancouver's most iconic nightclubs. While working there at the club, he was a computer science major in the 90s and eventually transitioned to becoming a CPA. But trading was the one passion that really followed him throughout the many decades. During the dot-com bull market era, Chinner was quick to jump onto the intersection between technology and finance, and he started trading. This has set him on a trading career that's been going strong for the last 20 years. Even though Chinner has traded and profited from every cycle of the business market, he will be the first to tell you that trading is never easy. He once lost $120,000 in 20 seconds. Today, we're going to be discussing Chinner's favorite trading strategies for stocks, options, futures, and even Forex, and his tax strategies for traders, and how to trade while raising three kids. I'm very excited to get started with today's conversation. Please welcome my friend, Chinner. Welcome to the fourth episode of Humble Traders, a podcast for active traders. I'm your host, Shay, aka The Humble Trader. If this is your first time tuning into our podcast, I interview and share stories, trading strategies, and experiences from some of the most inspiring traders from around the world. If that sounds interesting to you, please remember to smash the like button and subscribe to see more interviews like these in the future. Welcome to the show, Chinner. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Haven't seen you in two years. I a think. couple of years, yeah. yeah. In July 2020 was the last time we met. Yeah. Yeah. How, how's how's trading been with three kids now? Uh, it's good. Uh, I'm definitely not doing the morning drive like I used to with trading. I'm driving people to the bus. Uh, definitely need to take the first hour and a half till eight nine a.m. Pacific to center myself. But uh -huh. yeah, I'm definitely. It's I've adjusted. You've adjusted, okay. Yeah. Hopefully for the better. I think so. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't need to rush the first thirty minutes with everybody. I'm okay with. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with waiting and uh, getting, figuring out where the balance is and where where you guys are going. I think out of the many traders I know, you are one of the few people that I know that have started trading even before the dot com bu bubble bursted, right? Yes. How uh, long has it been since you've uh, been in the market? August August September 1996 was when I opened oh my, my first God. brokerage account. So that's what, 26, 27 years. Uh, in those early years, it was more like swing trading because I was basically going along with the trend in the 90s and it was working out, so I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. um, probably full day trading happened more like in the early 00s when the bubble burst and there was a little more need to get in, get out, like now. Right? So before the bubble bursted, you were just buying and holding for three months, actual um, underlying stock or options? I definitely, yeah, options actually. I started with options because I didn't okay. have that much money and things were hundreds of dollars and not some things were thousands of dollars. Uh -huh. So the only way to get in on those tech opportunities for me back then was to buy calls, right? So I would buy three to six month calls, usually on Ida, on stocks that split on me, knowing very well they're probably gonna return to the original sp split price pretty soon. And that worked, that worked for multiple years. So 96 to 2000. Okay. Um, yeah, 96 Four to like years. late 99. And then by early 2000, everything started changing, yeah. So would you say before 2000, things were quote unquote 
easy? <laughs> uh, they were easy because I was naive enough to think they were easy. Okay. Um, I don't think they were easier. I definitely think it was a bull market. Uh, I didn't know as much about shorting, so I didn't know how to get in trouble that way. Everything was going up, so that was helpful, helpful for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes that's a bliss to yeah, not I mean, short there during was the bull market. There was this small, uh, small order execution system called SOS, which allowed us to execute on computers automatically on under a thousand shares while the big players were still, still an open outcry pit. And it gave us some opportunities to front run news. Now that was a mixed blessing because they had Bloomberg and we had the news, right? So we still didn't get news that fast, Yeah. but we were able to execute small orders faster than market make makers at that time. So we were able to catch small opportunities here and there. I didn't tr track it well enough to really know if that made a difference, but that was my original thesis of why we wanted to get in, right? Oh, can you explain to our listeners what's o open outcry and why was that an advantage for retail traders S like you? So open outcry back then was what you see on TV. It was a whole bunch of people in a room yelling, I'm buying this, I'm selling this. And <laughs> With they had paper to, in their yeah, hands. Yeah, traders from different firms and market makers and hedge funds, whatever, and you know they were trying to make a deal and mm -hmm. they were fast, but it was obviously not as fast as the computerized systems are today. And that so system was a as a electronic system, sort of the first one, because market makers didn't want to deal with either penny stocks or smaller stocks that they weren't interested in or didn't have volume. So they sort of gave it to the system. If you traded under a thousand shares, it would auto execute like it does now. Wow. All right. So there was opportunities to occasionally get in faster and get out faster than a market maker. Right? Okay. So. That's like one of the rare opportunities you had to get in front of y the Yeah, if you think about it, in the 90s day traders were the original high frequency traders. Like yeah. it wasn't the same speed or by any means, but it was the idea was the same, right? That we can get in and get out for small amounts of shares before the big players can. Right? Oh. So when the dot com bubble bursted in 2000, what do you think made you like, how, how did you stay safe? Because I think a lot of people didn't, didn't see it coming. Did you see it? Well, I, de I, de I definitely wasn't. I, I Well, I saw a little bit of coming because I was in computer science. And I don't know if you remember what Y2K was, but there was this big rush that the entire computerized system is going to crash because in 2000, all the computers are going to think it's 1900 because they didn't have a full year in their computerized systems all across banking and trading. So there was this big fear on this. So I sort of was worried that something was gonna happen. I definitely didn't think it was gonna crash. Uh -huh. And I wasn't fully exposed. I mean, I was in calls, but again, calls expire worthless, limited exposure. So I didn't, I did lose, but I wasn't fully invested. Uh, okay. You have to understand some shares went from 3000 to like $300 in seven awesome. days, oh right? Okay. So it was, it was a big drop, right? And so a lot of people got liquidated. Oh. I was the safety I had was I was in options, so I just went to zero. There was nothing uh -huh. to liquidate. That was good, right? But so. you didn't blow up your account at no, all. No, at that point I was successful for several years to the point where like I had withdrawn money, uh, okay, that's and, good. and I was you know like I was scared to, to put have it all in there because I thought it was all going to go away. Uh -huh. So yeah, no, I didn't blow up. I had a relatively small loss in comparison to what could have happened. Yeah. Oh, was there any like memorable tech companies that you traded from the dot com era? Oh, uh, well, back then the big ones were really anything with a dot com. It was, <laughs> was, the game. was it like pets.com? Basically, well, just yeah. now that everything has AI in it, back then everything put dot com in it, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Nortel Networks was a big one that we traded. It was very popular in Nortel Bull Run. Do you know what that was? No. They're an, they're an Ottawa based company that's now out of business, but they did communication telephone systems. Oh, right? and they like intercoms? Like, no, like, like so just phone systems, but for large organizations. So like put in 15,000 phones that are all oh. connected by PBX in okay. the cloud. That was their sort of thing. They were actually a real big company and they, they blew up. They went out of business in, in 2000, right? Okay. Uh, Adobe and different things of that nature. Software oh. companies you know now. Uh, yeah. Those companies made money in a different way back then, right? Everything's software as a service now. But mm -hmm. then they were still pushing the actual physical DVDs. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, instead of getting Adobe for twenty three bucks a month, you're buying the full license for a grand. But you had to right? buy a disc. I remember disc you, or like a disc box. or a CD or yeah. yeah. It wasn't downloaded. Nobody's downloading anything, right? Uh -huh. So yeah, it was definitely it was a different time, but it was definitely fun because it was new and exciting, and I was winning. Right? How would you compare that bubble to? Well, I wouldn't say what happened in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty one was a bubble, but how would you compare that? hype to all the volume and extreme momentum we saw in the last yeah last two years after covid pandemic well so it was different so 
the business has changed, right? So mm -hmm. the difference is that, okay, yes, there was a, a huge bubble in tech, but when it burst, it was only one sector, it wasn't all the sectors. So that's the first thing to remember. And the second thing was that we're still dependent heavily on market makers, you know, taking buying something when nobody else wanted to, and they just dropped their bids, right? So mm -hmm. there was a huge pullback and you know the reason you have PDT is because of that 2000 blow up. There was no PDT before 2000. The reason you have PDT oh, today okay. is because so many day traders blew up during that time frame that I think the Bush administration in initiated the PDT rule. Yeah. Oh, so that was because of that blow up. Okay. That's why PDT, before in the 90s, there was no PDT. It's like, go, right? Six to one, go. As you probably already know from all of my YouTube videos, most of my strategies involve scalping, momentum, and shorting. All of those things will require a very fast broker platform. And I have an exciting promo from one of the premium brokers I personally use, Centerpoint Securities. If you're trading with over $30,000, you can use Centerpoint to day trade with zero commissions for 60 days. And that's not all. You'll also get access to Daster the Pro for one month for free. That's the trading platform you see in all my videos. That's another $150 value for free. To get this offer with all the freebies I just mentioned, you can sign up to Centerpoint Securities down below. And now let's get back to the video. Okay. But was day trading really, really popular during the dot-com bubble then? It was definitely, if that it many was, people I mean, up? it was my first recollection of it, but yes, just like day trading became popular in 2020 during mm -hmm. the pandemic because a lot of people became aware of it, it was definitely, that was the first, you know, way, way that people heard about it. You can do it at home. Mm. You know, the first time I heard about people sitting in their pajamas trading, <laughs> you know, quitting their jobs, that was, that was in the 90s, right? Oh, for sure. okay. Yeah. Let's take a step back. Um, did you have any former education in finance or anything related to trading? Not finance. Uh, I did a first, my first undergraduate degree was in computer science, and that sort of flowed well with me having a computer at home in the 90s when most people didn't, mm. and just being adept at setting up a brokerage account in a computer, you know, software that's second nature to most people now was not necessarily to all people in the mid nineties. Uh, I was one of, you know, my household had three computers and I was, un I was unheard of back, back then. Um, now, and the computers were giant. Uh, you yeah, know, they were desktops, they were desktops. Yeah. You know, they were ha like a mini tower, you know, it was probably this tall and couldn't get a big monitor though. So you sort of say mm, space and monitors, okay. but you had a big desktop, right? So, but it was, you know, you had a, you had a computer at home that was already a big deal. Uh, and then, so that was, it flowed well with, for, for me with getting into it. But beyond that, no, I learned from books that didn't have the communities we have now, right? You guys can mm -hmm. accelerate, a new trader can accelerate their learning in a year that it took me probably five, six, seven years to get through books and trying to meet people, right? Mm. In their early, in late 90s, early 2000s, anything online with trading was just pump and dump, right? Like, yeah, yeah you're, you're penny promoting, stock, you're promoting, to the oh, forums. You're promoting, you're promoting, you're promoting, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily helpful, or you were at least fearful that it wasn't helpful, right? So the reason I started with large cap stocks in the 90s was because I just didn't, didn't even want to know how to learn those small ones, right? Oh, so, so you started off straight into large cap, the tech yeah, companies, trading I got, options. Yeah, I got into small caps in the OOs because as I'll, basically I worked on Granville Street, and if you know the House Street Hustle, you know the House Street, how, how House Street, Street Hustle. Hustle? So, so the House Street has a lot of promotion firms for penny stocks. Oh, and the they, Vancouver exchange that used to exist. That, that doesn't exist anymore yeah, yeah, for a yeah. reason, there's so much fraud happening yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they would come, like they would promote, where do you promote? You promote people that have cash and carry money, they don't know anything. So they would come to the bars and restaurants and tell us about penny stocks all the time. What? All the time, but they were basically pushing promotion into different channels. This is. Uh before online, before spamming Twitter, before all this other stuff, people went on the street and did it, right? They did all the stock promotion in, in person, like at clubs and, and I'm the I'm sure bars? they did it via email too, but oh, like they, okay. all, they also did it in person. They just came in there, oh, wow. they had drinks, <laughs> they talked about it like they're in, in it and you should get in it. And you know, oh. tell these stories like 10 cents can turn into 20 cents really fast, that's a double. They would tell those stories, but really what I learned from them there is, it was gonna go parabolic in the next couple of days, okay. short it, it's gonna die, right? And then, so then I, I saw this a few times just by observation, and then later I learned to take advantage of that. Of the uh, short side or the long side? The short side. That's basically how I learned uh, how to short. Okay. So yeah, I definitely learned to short that way. We used to do things like at five in the morning, we'd look up the 
HQ and we drive around Vancouver and I'm like, hey, it's West 4th, it's a condo building, it's somebody's house, it's not a real company, right? We, we do those kind of things. That's how you did your research. Yeah, we do those kind of research, like oh. try to figure that out. Uh, I think Orain does that now by like, doing Google search. You can look at yeah, the address like on and, maps and, and, and you can look see the Google, Google picture of the HQ and if it's somebody's house or a decrepit shed, then you know it's not a real company. So we did that physically back then, yeah. Oh. So that was, in the early always I learned mining junior miners and how to short junior miners. Oh. That was sort of, that was a good time for that, yeah. Because okay. when the tech bubble burst, the resources went, right? So mm -hmm. China was ramping up, there was a big push for resources into developing nations like that, like, and so everything in Vancouver was jumping, right? Okay, and tell us about your first career, because well, I was so surprised when I found out. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I'm in accounting now, but my first career, uh, I was bartending on Granville Street and a nightclub here. Uh, at 932 Granville, you can look it up. It'll be easy to tell. It still one. exists. It Roxy. Still, it still exists. Yeah, I went there day. maybe five. Last time I went was maybe five years ago. Well, I was still in my clubbing phase. It's yeah, the, good, the wonderful thing about the Roxy is <laughs> it came there 20 years ago, five years ago, or today. They spent a lot of money to make it look the same forever. So uh. it's always going to be a staple of Vancouver the way it's, it's going for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, I worked there for what was supposed to be a few years, ended up being like 15, 16, 17 years where I was studying crossing over trading and mm -hmm. um, yeah but it taught me a lot of stuff because I, I like I met people there I learned uh, market profile which is sort of just how they distribute shares when they're promoting right mm. so a lot of that stuff I learned basically by observation maybe some people being too drunk and telling me some stuff that they shouldn't but it slowly pieced it together over time right so in a time when I didn't have an online community to learn from uh -huh. that was how I pieced Oh wow, together. that's like the the old school insider trading almost. Basically, Learning, I mean, hearing from if, the you're promoters. In full, if you're in a room full of drunk people, <laughs> you being the sober person is an advantage, right? Oh. So that, since you were bartending, you were always sober. Yes, we, we were sober uh. as many times as possible, for sure. Oh, yeah, that's so interesting. For for those who don't know, Vancouver used to have an exchange, and that's like the the pump and dump penny stock capital of the world. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they shut it down which year? I don't recall, but it's late after 90s. Wolf of Wall Street, I yeah, think. definitely, definitely late nineties. Yeah. They're talking about it. There was a lot of scandals, and then, but yeah, by by the time early O's, it was definitely over, uh, and they mm. went, everybody went OTC. There was a time when they started listing on both, right? They were on VSC and OTC because they were uh, they were basically okay. they were basically they they were worried that Vancouver was going to get shut down any minute, so they started listing yeah. on both. Um, okay, smart move. Yeah, and then I mean, then they went to Panama. A lot of local promoters that I knew have, have now moved to Panama and they do everything from Panama, right? Oh, so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's still going on though, it's just in a different scene, right? It's more digital, nothing more, in more person. Di more digital, more <laughs> offshore, makes it easier, right? Or it's mm. harder to track, but, and more erratic, right? Because they can do it faster. Because mm. I mean, I don't know how well you're doing with shorting, but what I've seen with uh, the offshore stocks coming in now, there's no rhyme or reason. They, they go parabolic, it's, they it's, go down, yeah. they go parabolic again. It's almost safer to go long because they're going to try to run it, right? So Shorting is not the same anymore. 100%. It used to be, well, it's like you said, it's never easy, no. but it used to be more straightforward yes. and easier to read. Nowadays, they understand that retail is getting into shorting, so they take advantage of that and trap them so many times, and then the actual dump happens. Yeah, that's something that's yeah. happened since the big short. I mean, I know everybody thinks they're genius when they think they can short, and when it goes down, they're going to make money. But like when I started, it was like the most dangerous thing. People would always say, don't short because you buy something, it can only go to zero, but you go short, it can go mm. to infinity. Uh, and those are you know lessons I still keep in mind to this day. If anything, I like to see when shorts get trapped and try to ride the wave on, on them getting out, right, if possible. So you're, you're usually more long biased. Almost 80%, yeah. Mm. I mean, obviously okay. I go short when I have to, but like even in futures, I'd like to see then go slam low and watch those slow slamming shorts pile in and then get in on top of them, right? Uh, so. so how has your trading changed from dot-com bubble that bursted, then you get into penny stocks and you know promotions gone? How has it kind of evolved over the years? Well, well, I mean, the first thing is just technology's evolved, right? I mean, mm -hmm. back in the 90s or even early lows, all I had was whatever interactive brokers or E-Trade gave me, which is, was useful. There was a scanner in there but it wasn't what I have now. Now we have trade ideas, scans, you have Benzinga, you have news that's as close to what professional traders have than ever before. Mm -hmm. So that alone, so access to technology has really improved. Obviously your internet connection is faster and 
So that's helped. Uh, probably the biggest thing I've I've changed though is I've stopped looking at candles really. Like I still do because every package has it, but I've really embraced market profile, mm -hmm. uh, which is more of like a bell curve little, little letter system. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, uh, but it sort of, it sort of tries to illustrate to you how long a stock has, a stock has spent at a certain price. Okay. And then so then and then gives you a point of control, right? So if you know that the price is $100 for eight hours, and then if it's now at 90, you know it's probably going to revert there or vice versa. It's up here. So it also illustrates, it's just a different way of looking at the same thing. So like okay. anything you've talked about, like a washout long or a parabolic with a Wix, it mm -hmm. basically shows that a single letter is running up and then coming down right away. For me, it visually really made me understand that hey, this is not going higher, this is just a run, or up or down, right? So it did that, and it also was the first methodology that really introduced different trading traders, like short-term, medium-term, long-term, and how all those people affect the market differently, right? So mm. it was the first strategy that told me, hey, if all the traders are thinking the same thing, that's your trend day, right? Yeah. And then if they're not, then maybe it's a choppy day, right? So uh, that was the beginning, that was in the middle of 03, 04, and that was the beginning of me understanding that, okay, there's more than just there's people doing business, right? It's basically explained as a business. Some people are doing this, some people are doing this, some people with lots of money are doing this. So where are you in this organization, right? So yeah, that was the beginning of me getting it. Okay, right? and that's in 2004. Yeah, 2003, 2004. I read a book called uh, uh, Mind Over Markets by Jim Dalton. If you mm -hmm. look him up, he still runs courses. I'm not promoting, I'm not affiliated with him, but he was. he definitely changed the way I think about it. And he basically showed it how, the, he explains it more like wholesale, like you're going out, like Costco buys a million units of something. That's how he explains wholesale traders in New York. Like we're just gonna buy a million units of futures and we're gonna buy it every, when we start, we're gonna take it up 20 points mm -hmm. and then we're gonna stop. And then as soon as they stop, they stop selling, then mm -hmm. they start dropping and they keep playing that game in circles, right? So sort of they go, you know, Costco can buy something for a dollar, make it twenty dollars. It doesn't sell, no problem. We sell it for ten dollars. Doesn't sell, we sell it for five dollars. We still made money, and that's what he mm -hmm. explains is that we want to get this maximum profit, but wholesale traders sort of run it up, run it down in circles, like over and over again, which creates that frustration for new traders. Who are like, it's breaking out. No, it's going down. You lose money, right? You go long, it goes short. You go short. Now you're short in the hole. They go long on you. That's what they are. That's what they're doing. That this is the first strategy that sort of explained. That's what other market participants are doing, so don't get caught in it, right? And so that's when I learned not to try to buy the breakout and mm. try to short the, the, the fall, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, even to this day, like, it's when I look at profile, it gives me more of an understanding or more of a calm about what I'm doing, uh, even if it goes against me right away, because I have understand that it's not going to go much further. And do you still stick with uh, options trading even till this day? Or has that kind of uh, I do. I do a combination of both. Okay. Uh, like, y yes, I do options trading. Uh, I like swinging option strategies that sort okay. of capture, you know, capture income. Uh, obviously, I have no problem yellowing with zero DT <laughs> here and there. Uh, I try to stay away from Fridays now, but. From yeah. Fridays? Okay, yeah. the YOLO calls, you don't do those anymore? I do. I just, you have to also remember like zero DTT is a new thing too, right? Like options existed for a long time, but it was mm -hmm. like monthlies, right? You only had zero DTT once a month. The fact that you have zero DTT now, every day, is what, last three or four years? Like, I don't even know how long that's been, but it's only, it's a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it definitely adds to the volatility, I think, like every, all the options expiring every day can't help uh, with, you know, smoothness. Uh, yeah, I definitely like to play options primarily on larger stocks, right? Because I, I have money, but I can still buy more of, of say, Nvidia right now if mm -hmm. I long calls, right? After hearing China's experience over the last two decades, do you think trading is now getting quote unquote easier or more challenging than ever? Let us know in the comment section below. Nowadays, do you still focus on just trading options or have you kind of branched out to equities or any other assets? Yeah, I mean, I've always been in equities and options. It just comes down to like, if the equity is expensive, I'm gonna go option route. And if the mm. premiums are worthwhile, uh, but now because of time constriction in the morning with kids, I've expanded to futures in the last five, six years, primarily ES mini futures. Uh, they've been around since the mid nineties, uh, but they allow me to trade, for example, midnight Pacific, which is London open and have an opening mm. drive then when everybody's sleeping and I have a little more time and calm than at 6.30 in the morning Pacific when it's a little crazy for me. So yeah, I've expanded that way. Uh, 
play some zero DTTs for sure. Uh, zero what? Zero day. Oh, expiry, <laughs> expiry options. options. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes I YOLO. Just, YOLO. Sometimes I just sell them and see if I can go to if I can go to zero. Okay. Uh, the EV is the same on both sides because for the amount of you might win ninety five percent of the time selling, but that one percent you lose, it's going to take your profits with you, right? So yeah. It's, it go, it's a back and forth, really. If you get overexposed. Um, yeah, I mean, beyond that, I mean, I focus on just whatever's, whatever's running, right? So mm. I like to look like the larger stocks because I feel like I have a, even not an edge, I just feel like other people have less of an edge to manipulate, so I have a, more of a chance to survive. Uh, definitely, I'm stay away from the smaller stocks these days under $10 okay. as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, primarily, I can get the size I want. I mean, I can, but I not with, not discreetly, and then then things get crazy and then, mm -hmm. then I get frustrated. I agree. And then, yeah, it just gets bad. So I've stayed away from those, try to stick to larger th names uh, and futures where the liquidity is high and I feel like um, maybe I'm the small fish, but at the same time, there's other big fish and nobody has an edge beyond just playing okay. what's happening in front of you. Right? Tell us in a big picture, yeah. what's your strategy like whenever you're trading options or futures? Uh, I definitely like... Well, we all use VWAP. Your favorite so. strategy, I guess. Uh, I like reversion from the mean or rotation. So I like to watch a, a you know, wash out long or, or just it run to the downside, stop, start slowing down. Mm -hmm. And then I want to get in long and I want it to revert. So I like to w watch watch the opening balance. This is, a, this is again, a, a market profile thing where it runs to the bottom. I'm pretty sure it stops running. And then I'm going to go long, wash out long versus parabolic short. Okay. In profile, the idea is that it's going to, if it started here and ended up here, it's going to start going back here. If it can't keep breaking, it's going to keep going, it's going to revert back to at least halfway back. So that's my probably mm. my favorite one. Okay. And then obviously VWAP, reclaim, re VWAP, reject. We live on that pretty much mm -hmm. for every, from everything from futures to uh, big caps, small caps, live on VWAP. Uh, yeah, those are the two big ones uh, that I like. I try to stay away. From, I mean, obviously in a trend day, I have no problem going all in and just writing it up or down. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's easy. That's not always easy to identify, right? Mm -hmm. Right away. Yeah, probably the ro the rotation of of a zone, right? Just down, up, down, up. If you look at futures, that happens quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Like this morning, I think it rotated like three times before it broke out, up and down, up and down. Like so, you can capture forty points in ES futures with even on a small one or two contracts is several thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, that's what I like to play the most. I feel most comfort identifying that. And, okay. and then also it seems to be successful based on my journaling, right? So a big thing I got into when I started to get profitable in the OOs was figuring out that, you know, my expected value, but like my execution. I sort of brought everything back down to pro sports, right? So. I know how to play basketball, and you know how to play basketball. I don't. I, okay. The, the principle. <laughs> I the, just gotta be honest. The, pr the principle is: I know the rules of basketball, and okay. I know how to play basketball. I know how to throw a three throw. But if I go against uh, even a retired Michael Jordan, he's going to take me to town because his execution is so much better. Of course. I, I applied that to trading. So even though you might give me your strategy, and it works well for you, mm -hmm. and you back tested at eighty six percent. That's you executing that. So when I started tracking my journaling, yes, the strategy was important, but how well I executed was also important. So that came mm. together for me into getting a percentage win rate, whatever that was. And then I could have, have an idea of what my expected value of winning was on a regular basis, right? And beyond that, to improve that execution, I spent a lot of time after, like in the afternoons, replaying, retrading, a win or a loss. I always took the time to basically replay it, see if I could do it better, or see mm. where I, or see if I got lucky, because the biggest fallacy I think that happens to people in markets right now is, I made 300 grand in three months, yeah, congratulations, you still could have done everything wrong, got lucky, right? So yeah. it, the, we, big numbers are posted and people get excited. True, but that, so that, true. But that, and that doesn't mean that it's, you're doing the right thing, but it's really mm -hmm. hard to convince somebody otherwise. So you really have to take a step back, look at what you're doing, you know, look that, hey, this was a winner, but did I get lucky or did I actually execute what I thought was appropriate? And especially, in, you know, if you record your screen or at least have a replay of some type now, what you remember and what really happened are two different things very often, mm -hmm. in my experience. Uh, I always think I know exactly what happened and I, when I replay it, uh, it never is that way. Right, so. so even after so many years, you're still doing the journaling, replaying oh, and recording. I, I feel like 
that effort, like I feel your success is a lagging indica indicator of your effort. It's just mm. lagging indicator of your effort because you do it, you're going to get some success and you stop doing it, you'll stop being successful. Like, yeah, it, it, like you, can so go, you, you can coast a little bit, you can coast a little bit on your, on your hard work from the past, but if you're not continually updating yourself, you, it's going to go away, right? Just like mm -hmm. if you're a, a lawyer, you have continuing education credits, same thing with being a trader. You have to, you have to just keep on top of what's happening, see how you're executing things change in the market with you, and you know, are you staying on top of that, right? And since you're in our Humble Trader community quite yeah. a bit, yeah. I remember we used to talk about short squeezes that yeah. you love to play. Yeah. Can you kind of talk about what kind of strategy do you play on that and how often do you get to play these short squeezes? Um, lately, not as much as I wanted to, but in the past, I really enjoyed, I, I perfected the short squeeze during the BlackBerry years. And the reason I, I say the BlackBerry years is because I learned something with BlackBerry that I applied to in the future to now Tesla and other stocks, and that is a polarizing stock. So BlackBerry, like Black, BB, right? That's correct. So BlackBerry was obviously a huge brand in the early 2000s, and mm -hmm. it was everything. But then when the iPhone came in, it started waning. But there was a lot of lot of opinions, right? People like iPhones better, uh, BlackBerry's oh, wow. better. Just like now, there's a lot of opinions with Tesla. Electric is the future. No, it's not the future. Blah 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 blah. But that builds. That's a perfect melting pot for people going like, I'm going to be short seller. No, I'm going to go long. And that creates opportunity for them to get overexcited and start shorting. And I can almost, like when I, when, I, when Tesla went from $250 to $2,000 in that <laughs> two year span, yeah. I could have sh not predicted the final outcome, but I was able to see how short sellers were piling in and how at $400 was too expensive and at $600 was too expensive and $900 was too expensive. But it didn't matter. The fundamentals weren't in play there. There was it was all supported on short positions, right? And mm -hmm. while some short positions were able to, you know, hold out like Bill Gates or somebody of that nature, a lot of people weren't, right? So one of the first natural strategies I identified when I started day trading was that if a stock closes strong, it gaps up in the morning. And now I understand that's because just market participants are just taking out shorts, catching yeah. liquidity, just a little more, just another 10% or 5%, even if it drops right away afterwards, because they're just trying to take people out. So I saw that with Tesla a lot. I had a really good summer in 2019 with Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat, same thing, fake meat. Uh, no, real meat's the future. No, fake meat's he healthier. I remember but, that, but that discussion, that, that, yeah. But that, that's, a, that's a very strong polarizing stock, and that stock opened at $40 in May, and it was $200 in August, right? So before I think in September the lockup from insiders came out and then everybody dropped it. But mm -hmm. it was, people kept shorting and it kept going up. Like that was, in the summer of 2019, I could have thrown a dartboard with as many calls as possible on Beyond Meat and every morning I woke up in profit, right? Right. It was, it was those were the strategies that really have moved forward to any kind of short situation is where I want people to be like, no, this company's overvalued. I love hearing that because Yes, it might be, and I, I'm in accounting, I can definitely give you the calculation on that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. The market can still stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent, right? So so true. And so that's what I look for. I look for people being opinionated and going against the trend, and I'm gonna try to take them out. Do you think that's what happening? what's happening with the AI stocks right now? With Nvidia crushing everything, with earnings just yesterday after hours? Well, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, they did great. I mean, yeah. first of all, they're they're doing great as a company, so that doesn't hurt. Yeah, uh, definitely opinions, right? Definitely opinions where AI is going, uh, opinions where Nvidia is going. Um, yeah, I don't think I would short Nvidia or any kind of tech anytime soon. Um, any kind of tech or just like a, like companies AI, associated a, a, well, with AI? I feel like anybody that's in tech is going to be associated with AI, right? It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. It's 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 our current crypto, and obviously <laughs> there's going to be some successful people that emerge from that, right? Just like mm -hmm. from the dot com Amazon emerged and then they're successful, right? And so somebody's going to emerge out of AI, be super successful, and it's going to be a super valid company. It might be Nvidia, it might be Microsoft. We don't know, uh, mm -hmm. but it definitely, yeah, definitely. People, are, some people are people are creatures of habits. So anything new, people are going to be like, no, this is this is not real. We're going to yeah. short it, and that can lead to successful upside, right? And even in down markets, people always ask me in two thousand eight how that went. Yeah, everything went down, but it wasn't it didn't go down a straight line. Right? Mm. There were still a lot of short squeezes and a lot of dead cat bounces that took people out that were short without conviction, right? So, yeah. What are some of your favorite short squeeze plays in the last, I don't know, last two years, two, three years? De definitely, okay, so with short squeeze plays, I like to look at how 
some market profile of how structure in the stock is building over over a period of say a month or two. So you can see sort of like in profile, they have these single run prints, which is basically shows that, hey, this, the price was here, now it ran up here and before it started building out more. And it shows that it's sort of like a P shape. And that P mm -hmm. shape illustrates to me that these new prices are built on top of, of short positions because when it ran up, that, that increment where that one lines there, it's only less than half an hour in that price point, trapped shorts. And then they built more okay. on top of it and they went up again. And it's sort of, you can see it in candles more on a long time frame, like big gap ups. And then, yeah. and then consolidation, big gap ups, it's the same thing. It's just a different way to visualize it. When I see that, I go, this, sh this is short positions. Now it's gonna take some, there's gonna take some, it's gonna take some inventory or some stock to really drop it. So I watch that for a month or two. Uh, and then I'll start, uh, and then I'll start building a position into it, knowing that it's going to squeeze sometimes into something like a news report, but or some sort of announcement. That's but that's worked really well for me. Um, it doesn't have to be three months. Sometimes just four weeks, three weeks. Mm -hmm. But I can see that it's built on top of just shorts getting like even recently, right? Oh my God, that debt ceiling, everything short, everything. No, no, it's it might still be bad. We don't know. But the point is that. It wasn't a done deal either way, right? So people got overzealous, thought the thing was going to go short, and you can squeeze them out of that. And that's both, both in futures and in stocks, and let alone if a stock like NVIDIA reports well, if you get lucky with that. Mm -hmm. I don't play as many r earning reports as I used to. I feel that's a little bit of a crapshoot, and yeah. I've been on the wrong end of it enough it's times. It's a gamble, 50-50. I've, I've been on the wrong <laughs> end of it enough times that it's like maybe not, right? And also I play options, so like a lot of the... IVs priced in to a lot of options before yeah. earnings, so like there isn't really much of an edge there. Um, but definitely, as soon as they announce, I'll, I'll get in on something for sure. Um, okay. Because I, I know there's a continuation there. Yeah, I definitely, I'm definitely more optimistic as a human being, so I like more upside. Like, a yes, we short. Yes, there's times when times we short. But every time I'm short, I'm like, yeah, I don't like this. It doesn't feel uh, good. But when I'm when I'm long, I'm like, this feels good. Like it's gonna go. Right? Okay. So it's definitely it's definitely a personality thing for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because I've spoken to many, you know primarily full-time sh short position traders and they're like no no no, i wanted to go parabolic i want to make sure this is a crap company i'm going to go short i'm like yeah yes to all those things but i can still keep going right that's that's always my thing right and that's mm. my vision is like it's going to keep going which you know if i don't pay attention will catch me in trouble in small caps where they'll drop it on me right so yeah why i like to stick with larger companies where i sort of know more than mechanics of the market, what's going to happen, right? So I, I rely on that. I rely on the fact that if I'm right, then bigger players will take out, will run it up to take out smaller players and I'll just come come along for the ride. That's usually what I like to r r r sort of rest my laurels on is that I'm not that smart, but somebody else is smart. I'm going to try to follow them, right? So, so you're usually more long biased. Has that 100%. ever gotten you into like in trouble? Any like big losses from being too long biased? Too bullish? Well, I mean, and not not so much in stocks because I was able to always to get out. There was an incident with Forex though in You traded Forex too. You traded everything. I've, I've, it's been twenty six years. I've traded I've traded everything. Forex, micro caps, big caps. Uh, probably the least I've traded is crypto, but I've traded crypto. Uh, but yeah, in Forex, I was trading Forex. Forex was very popular for us in 2008 onward because before the stock market was fully recovered, mm -hmm. trading currencies seemed to be like the liquid thing to do that couldn't really mm. hurt you that much, right? Okay. So I was trading uh, the Swiss franc uh, euro pair. So if you don't know how Forex works is the value of one currency has to be pegged against another currency. So it's mm -hmm. called a pair. So Swiss franc against the euro. I was long the Swiss franc because the Swiss franc at the time was a very, 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 very strong. It was no matter, it couldn't get beaten down. And I was long on maybe a $200,000 position. Keep in mind, it's cash, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you can lose 1%, might be four grand, you know, nothing, nothing huge. Uh, but then at 1.30 a.m. Pacific, on I believe it should be September 11th or 10th, 2011, uh, the, Swiss, the, the Swiss National Bank came out saying, hey, the strong Swiss franc is hurting our exports. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna defend the Swiss franc by dr selling into the market and lowering its value so that people in the Euro Eurozone will buy from us. <sighs> Currency went down 9%, 10% in the 60 Oof. seconds. My stop got blown and the slippage was, I don't know, very large. It was about $120,000 loss in a minute or two. Oh my God. Um, 
That was 1 a.m. our one, local one, time. Yeah, one thirty in the morning our time. Yeah, so that, that announcement came out in, in Europe, and that was probably the biggest loss I've taken. A little bit of instant sweat. Uh-huh. Went for a cigarette. The whole the whole nine yards, right? So only one cigarette. Only one. Yeah. Okay, that, that's yeah, good. Only one, but we don't we don't smoke anymore. Yeah, uh, that's good. Wiser, smarter, but back then that was that was yeah, that was that, 2011. That was 2011, oh, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, trading Forex was wonderful because you learned a lot of things about inflows, outflows, cash, right? So what we learned in 2008 was, yes, the stock market went down, but for Canadians, the U.S. dollar was par, too, or actually below par at one point. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of opportunity for us to get into the U.S. market in anything, housing, stocks, because we were purchasing purchasing currency at a rate that hasn't been seen since. So even though the the value of something didn't go up, the currency was going to probably rebound. So that's... I know many, 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 many Canadian investors who did very well because they just went all in on either American real estate, uh, American Winnebago's, uh, and yes, uh-huh. obviously if they had bought banking stocks in the States as well, right? So uh, yeah, there was lots of opportunity. I mean, I bought Lululemon for like $12 a share in oh 2008, God. right? Starbucks for $6 a share. You know, in hindsight, not large enough positions that I should have, I bought a few thousand shares here and there, but mm-hmm. still, you know, those were, once in a lifetime opportunities it seemed it didn't feel that way at the time but it definitely definitely was yeah so when okay so you kind of saw the same thing again in 2020 yeah in 2020 when everything's so fearful but the, like, but the bounce back was so much faster right in 2020 uh, where would you guys drop for a month right yeah we dropped for you know a couple years a couple years right uh, let's say that a solid year where you weren't sure it was going to bounce by 2009 you're like okay it's bouncing it's good it's sort of settled but still didn't come back. And then 2010 was the beginning of whatever we see now, the bull run mm-hmm. into 2023. So, yeah, no, I mean, hindsight's 2020, but definitely definitely being ready and understanding what's going on and understanding that in the, I hate to quote like uh, Warren Buffett, but in the grand scheme of America and Canada, it's going to survive. It's going to keep moving forward. So just keep going, right? So With that law specifically that we just talked about, yeah. were you... Were you already in accounting back then? Were you able to? You know? uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I was. I was. In a, I was probably a senior accounting student at that point. Uh, okay. So yeah, as I was an accountant student, um, yeah, I understood what, what was happening. I understood how. I you know I emotionally internalized and accepted that loss. I feel a lot of people talk about being able to take a loss, but what really happens is they can hold a loss. If you see, oh, I'm holding a loss, I'm, that's great, but you need to be able to take a loss, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, that's, I think, where a Realize it. Realize the loss. Exactly, it's time yes. to get out. Yeah. You were wrong. It's okay. Let's keep moving yeah. forward. Um, the reason I think a lot of people say trading is like a business, treat like a business, is because when you're in business for yourself, you make a lot of mistakes and you have to keep taking punches to the face and figure out the right way to do things. And the same thing happens in trading, right? You're... You're wrong more often than you're right, but can you cut the losses fast and just focus on the winners, right? And try to inch your way to the success route, right? Because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, didn't happen to me like that. It was like try it, no, try it, no, try it, no. Okay, this one's okay. Try, keep doing this one a little bit. Try this one, no. Okay, keep doing this one. That's how I slowly inch my way there, right? Um, probably slower than most people, if I had to, uh, if I had to gauge, because I talk to people now. Like even the market profile thing, I, I think it took me like four or five years to absorb that. That just a general idea of how that works, mm. right? So now, that now people are absorbing information and learning much faster. Once they get on something, the resources are much broader, right, from different sources. And yeah, if you want to put an effort, you're going to be able to get there really fast. Since you practice accounting, does it help you kind of optimize your trading profits? How to do things more, operate your business more tax efficiently? Well, obviously, I have tax knowledge, so yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, can we talk about starting a family trust that has a hold code that has an operating company? Yes, I, I know how to do that. Is it absolutely necessary for every trader to have that kind of complex structure? Probably not. Mm. It, you know, you have to have a certain level of income to make that worthwhile from a just a cost perspective. So, I mean, some of the advantages I have, as we talked to in different webinars, is that I know how to self-incorporate and start a corporation and keep it running. But if you don't can't do that yourself, you're gonna have to. Buy, you know, hire advisors to do that for you. So is that first 20, 30, 40, $50,000 investment for that worth it? Now there comes a point in your profit career where yes, you're gonna give this much money to the CRA or to these people to save you money. So let's save you money. So that makes sense. Uh, you know, when I always tell people the first thing you can do when you're trying to do tax planning strategies for yourself is just, it's not sexy, but good bookkeeping. 
you know, keep the records of your expenses. You know, if you're I'm tr- falling asleep here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it's true, right? If, yeah. you, if you don't want to do it, then hire somebody to help you do it. Or there's lots of apps now that will help you do it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, track where you spend money because remembering last week is different than remembering last year. And if in the beginning, even if you are profitable, you know, the, you can probably write off thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars of subscriptions and travel and mm-hmm. books and different things that apply to your trading, which will reduce your net income. Um, I mean, beyond that, it's always hard to give you advice because if you are working a job for two hundred grand a year and you made ten grand a year in trading profits, that could hurt you more than if you're a student unemployed and you made thirty grand in trading profits because. You know, you'll actually get taxed at a 60% mm-hmm. rate on that 10 grand because you made 200 grand elsewhere. But if you're not earning any other income, 30 grand with even no expenses is basically no tax, right? So I think knowing your personal situation and always getting professional advice, but then always paying the CRA because they want to get their fair share. Yes, um, always pay the CRA. Yeah, we always we adv- advise you to pay all uh, tax authorities in all countries. Um, there's always a lot of legal ways to structure your finances to reduce taxes. Um, and in Canada, after bookkeeping, it would be set up a corporation, right? Because their okay. the first half a million dollars in profits in an operating company is taxed at 11% mm-hmm. in BC, slightly different different provinces, but it's favorable, considerably more favorable uh, than a personal tax rate, which starts at 26% and goes all the way up to 60, right? So uh, from perspective, 200 grand a year profit, you pay 120 grand personally or like, 28 grand in a corporation. So that's that's at that level is when you get to a point where okay, if I only if I had to pay 200, you know, 120 grand to the CRA and now my accountants and t- lawyers take 40 grand and I and I save still save 60 grand that way, then that makes sense to start engaging all those people mm-hmm. in helping you to get there, right? So would you say like 100k mark it's kind of like the crossing point? Yeah, it's somewhere for traders. Was, yeah, 100k, 100k profit, right? So you might mm-hmm. be able to make 150k, you have expenses to get you down to 100k and then that's where it starts making sense to do those do those things. I mean, mm-hmm. we talked about this before. The other issues you have with incorporating is, you know, you have to get a brokerage account and corporate name. Now you're you know, you're, Everything's more expensive. Yeah, data you're, fees. You're a professional. As soon as you have a corporation, yeah. you're a professional. So your data fees are much higher. The same thing you spend a hundred dollars for is now five hundred bucks. All right. So you have to be ready for that. But if you're ready mm-hmm. for it, then I would advise you do it. I would advise you plan for it because I've always talked to people. And the wonderful thing about trading is you never know when you're going to become successful. So like you can be it's, no, 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 it's no, no. It's always no, no. like a surprise. So uh, some, it's good to be prepared because yeah. if. You know, you might have had losses for multiple years, but then you had a blowout two months, and we have a couple of people in the room that are like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when, if you're not ready, and in, in other businesses too, all of a sudden you turn around, you have a high tax bill, like, what happened? I'm like, well, welcome to making money, and that's the reality now, right? So you just have to be ready for it. And usually first time entrepreneurs of all types, if it's trading or any other business, they don't make money, they don't make money, they don't make money, and then they do, and they're like, what do I owe money? I'm like, well, now you've made money, right? So. Mm. Yeah, I would say be ready, right? So if you do want, I would almost incorporate it earlier, earlier and not use it and be ready. Because as mm. soon as you start being profitable, what I would advise you is to just, you know, hey, I just had a good month personally. Okay, switch over right now to corporate next oh, month, right? okay. Like transfer the money and start. Because there's one thing if you made 100 grand one month, but you start doing that for five months, it's a completely different game, right? But wouldn't you want to personally use those losses you incurred the previous years? Yes, and, 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 those are, and those are things I don't know, right? I'm assuming oh, okay. you don't have losses right. or you're readily neutral, sure. Mm. If, you have, if you're carrying heavy losses from before, definitely apply those. But if, you, if you've you know, gotten it and you think you're going to be a $100,000 a month trader, roughly, then switch over to, to, to the corporate side. And if you're mm. not, then you can always go back and forth. I know people that go back and forth all the time, right? Oh. So they sort of switch over. To, they'll make like 40, 50K personally. They'll run the rest of the corporation, mm-hmm. uh, depending on what's convenient for them, right? Uh, definitely, I would say it doesn't take a lot of money to incorporate to, and keep it dormant. Uh, if you're on the cusp, go for it and be ready. Yeah. I guess there's no such thing as, okay, some people might hate me for this. In, um, in the States, yeah. They, they have, you know, a lot of traders, they move to Puerto Rico. Sure. In Canada, we don't have... No, not as far as I know. There's yeah. no there's no jurisdiction that has a <laughs> trading-free zone. Uh-huh. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, having something in the Cayman Islands set up for us because it is a British ex-colony. That's okay. like more of a joke uh, than anything else. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. there's no there's no jurisdiction in Canada right now. Have you, to go to Dubai. Dubai, yeah, that's... 
if you start making enough money, then yeah, the Dubai is the route. Mm -hmm. uh, become domiciled there, corporation there, trade from there, right? Yeah. As a trader and as a CPA here in Canada, Chenner has been sharing a lot of professional advice on tax strategies, managing money as a trader. If you appreciate them, please remember to smash the like button and feel free to leave any more money tips you may have down below. You've been trading for over 20 years. Has there ever been a point or multiple moments where you thought about quitting trading altogether? Uh, I don't think I've ever thought about quitting, but there's definitely moments where I slowed down because of life, right? When I was going through accounting courses or just a little bit of a draw, drawdown and didn't have money mm. to put back into the system. I think people assume that I was sitting in front of the terminal for 25 years every day, Monday to Friday trading, but it's not like that. I definitely went through like bursts where I traded for three years very regularly and then it slowed down more about swing trading and occasional day trading okay um depending on what i was doing in life um what was the longest break you had from trading maybe six months and oh, that okay. wasn't i wasn't really a break i was in i was in swings but yeah i wasn't trading daily um mm. yeah i mean in the last decade definitely not any big breaks there were some breaks in the probably early oos to late oos I guess sometimes I was just traveling with friends. Sometimes I was just wasn't into it. I was focused on other things. Uh, but yeah, I was always monitoring the markets and always doing research. So that was always an ongoing thing. Uh, it was definitely always an interest of mine. I think that was probably the difference that a lot of people go, "Oh, I want to make quick money." I'm like, "Yeah, I want to make money, but I'd like to I'd like to know why, like why it's happening." Mm. Like I was always interested in why it's happening. And so when I talked about different things like short squeezes and different things that mechanically happen. I was always interested to know why those were happening because I know it wasn't just me. It's a, it's a series of events. So I was definitely always a, almost a renaissance man when it comes to learning about the markets, right? And that's always an ongoing journey because I don't feel I'm done in any way, shape or form because it's changing. Mm -hmm. Always changing. Always changing. Yeah. And no matter how much you think you know, somebody comes along or something comes along or an event comes along to make you go, no, no, no. That's why you're humbled, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Would you call yourself a degen? Oh, I have degen de de tendencies for sure. I feel like <laughs> you can't, I mean, people that are interested in making money from trading or any other kind of pursuit like poker or any kind of other online activities tend to have a little bit of a gambling, I wouldn't say addiction, but at least interest, mm -hmm. right? So interest in making money from not direct work. Uh, that definitely is something that's in me and for, for sure is in a lot of people. Whether or not you embrace the degen and that's all you do that comes down to your control your emotions and your study and work right um i've always talked to traders another no 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 slag on the small communities but communities are so supportive in the trading communities but sometimes mm -hmm. if you're gonna make a change if, like if you keep losing and going to the community saying i lost again everybody's very supportive like we're gonna review your chart we're gonna help you out we're gonna we're gonna get you back on the horse, but they keep doing that over and over again, and then they're just getting a dopamine hit from losing, right? And if you ever study people who have gambling problems, they usually have, you know, they have one first big win, and then they're not really chasing the win anymore. It's that moment before they win or lose, that's the excitement for them. So, huh. and so if you are getting into that downward spiral of degeneracy, where you're just getting in, to see if you're going to go up and really the, the anticipation of where it's going to go is, is, is the driver, then you should take a step back and reevaluate what you're doing. But you do need a little bit of risk tolerance because I've seen people on the other side who are very risk averse and they just won't pull the trigger. They'll, yeah. just, they'll just sit there and, and watch it the yeah, whole day. Yeah, I've seen traders who do that so, too. So there is a balancing there. Obviously, too much degen, bad, you're going to lose all your money. Uh, but not being able to get in mm -hmm. is also a, a negative. So I've, most people I've met have the degen in them and you have learned to control it. Yeah, basically. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes more sense, actually. Everyone has some sort of level of degen. Yeah. Do you think having, I know you have three kids yeah. now, do you think having kids kind of change the way you trade or how you see trading? Yeah, well, it helped me emotionally, right? Because mm. uh, I have a good, really, good, really good story about this. So kids have very, very emotional control. They, they have tantrums. Yes. I remember when my first son, Andrew, I uh, forget when, he's probably four, three or four, and he, I was taking him to daycare and he had a huge, huge, huge meltdown at Tantrum. And I remember it was emotionally exhausting for me and then I got him to daycare. And I fast forward about two hours in a trade 
I lose. I lose my mind. And I start and I start having an emotional meltdown that was pretty much a carbon copy of my son's. Oh. And I remember stopping to myself and going, "Oh, sorry, buddy. You got it for me." <laughs> so you're the problem. Yeah. So it definitely it helped because the things that you may not see in yourself, you now mm. see in another person, and, and then you can identify and help correct. So it definitely oh. helped me identify some of my emotional frustrations. Uh, if you talk to my assistant, why I have mechanical keyboards, there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a lot of smashing, so <laughs> definitely, it definitely helped me identify myself better, right? Okay. Because A, they're their own stress case, and mm -hmm. they also exhibit behaviors that they got from you, right? Either they learned them from you, or they inherited them from you, but either way, they tend to copy you, and that's helpful to see what you really like. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard that from any trader. I guess that a lot of traders I talk to don't have kids. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. if you either, I know people that started with once they had kids, uh -huh. but because I was a trader before kids, mm. then I had children. That was the change, right? Because when you're when you're by yourself and you're analyzing yourself, no matter how honest you are, you tend to lie to yourself. At least that's my opinion, right? You tell so, yourself what you want to hear. Yeah, like I'm not that bad. I'm doing hard. I'm working, trying, I'm trying hard. I'm hard trying. Enough. I'm reading. I'm putting in the hours. I'm trading. I'm analyzing. But when you see yourself with children, a things happen with children outside of your control. No matter how good you are, how bad you are, it's going to happen. So you're doing the best you can. And then you see, like I said, either your behaviors because they copy you. So that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also their personality tends to mimic one of the parents. And when you start seeing those things, uh, that's when you realize, oh, okay, now that's real. I, I'm, I can't lie to myself yeah. this is happening. So that's, that's probably giving me the most adv advantage emotionally in the last decade was just mm. seeing my kids react, understanding three things that A, I also react that way, so try to control it. B, when you're frustrated like a child, stop right so that's a big thing because that's what we do with children that they're frustrated we let them stop maybe we hug them out we give them some time out time in a room i've applied a lot of the same rules to trading right hey i had a bad trade don't give another trade right away take five minutes have a walk have a coffee mm. watch a video right um yeah definitely learning to take timeouts in trading and when i mean timeouts it's not like weeks off but like five to 15 minutes because i feel when i watch people blow up and i've watched people blow up live it's because they lose they flip bias or they go in again, yeah. go in again, go in again in a rapid succession, and that's the big issue. If you just do one loss and stop, it's usually never that bad. Mm -hmm. it's, it's recoverable. It's recoverable, yeah. maybe not today, but in the next five days, 10 days. Uh, but when you go back, 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 that's when it turns into something that maybe blows up your account mm -hmm. or becomes a psychological problem where now you're like, I lost last three months, right? So, yeah. Do you think having, I want you to be honest. Sure. Do you think having kids helped you become a better trader? Uh, like hard, before and after? It's hard to say because yes, in the emotional sense, I've learned a lot about myself. Uh -huh. I learned about a lot of what I can endure because there's a lot of lack of sleep, a lot of you know, a lot oh of God, things that no go with sleep. lack of sleep. Uh, there's you know, it's it's some it's I'm, they're amazing, but sometimes they do take a lot of energy and on continual effort. So it's hard to say if I'm a better trader because of it, because maybe if I was sleeping eight hours a night and always well rested <laughs> at 6.30 in the morning, I'd be a better trader, right? So I don't know. Right, Having said that, it has identified a lot of my frustrations and has taught me how to stop when it's time to stop, and which has kept me in the game this long. So that's, mm. for me, I feel that's a win, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll have kids then. Uh, it's a personal decision. I, I, I'm obviously biased, and I highly, I highly encourage it. But obviously, everybody lives their own life. I was kidding. Uh, you can I cut this out, but like the, in the, in today's world, people are like, "You can't make me have kids." I'm like, "I have uh, kids. Yeah, don't be a." People call me a. It's a personal. People decision. have called me a breeder before, and I'm like, so I try not to. Oh, like I love my kids, and I'm yeah. obviously I'm all in on the kids, but it's obviously I don't want to. You know, it's a, it's a polarizing subject. It, we could Talk to Elon Musk. He has like, what, five kids? Yeah, listen. Seven? If, if you're a multi-billionaire and you're a genius, you should, you should yes. Oh. I, I, I understand why rock stars and people who are extremely wealthy have a lot of children, do it. You have the money to support them. Mm. Just do it. It's, it's great. But for the average person like us, we don't have the nannies. We don't have the support. We don't have the finances. Well, we do, but like it's not to their level. Mm -hmm. And it's it, there's a toll, right? Like you know how this business is your baby. Imagine having three of them like that, plus your business, right? They just they're just there and they're and they're little personalities that, that grow and are wonderful, but tiring, 
right? So very tiring. Yeah, I was so surprised to hear that you still stay up till 12 to trade, and then you take them to school at what, like 6.30? Uh, they, they start school at eight, so they, they get yeah. up at 6.30 to be on the bus by 7.30, yeah. Uh -huh. So so I, you sleep, what, what, four hours a day? Yeah, you don't need that much sleep. I listen, I don't, I, I, I don't stay up till midnight every, every night. I, uh, I do sleep sometimes. Sometimes. When, I, when I'm tired, I go to bed. Uh -huh. uh, I also do this, this, this child sleep. Sometimes a child needs me, so I'll fall asleep with them at 7 p.m. I'll get up at 9 p.m. Now I'm trading till 1 a.m. Now I go back to sleep. Oh, so I, I, do that, I do broken sleep like that sometimes, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's times where I've fallen asleep with a child at 6 p.m. and gotten up at 2 in the morning. I'm like, well, I guess I'm up for the day now. So I guess I'll go train. I guess I'll go train and get ready for the pre-market, <laughs> right? So those things have happened, right? And that's and sometimes the best laid plans fall apart that way because mm. kids get sick. Kids just are cuddlers. They want to cuddle, right? So it's definitely, you have to prepare for the unexpected, right? Mm. If you ever talk to like seasoned parents, the reason we're so organized is because so many things can fall apart. We need to line up. The few things that the, the half a dozen things that we can plan ahead, we're going to uh -huh. plan ahead because the other two dozen things are just going to happen, right? So, yeah. Circling so back to some of the AI stocks we talked about, what's your opinion on AI trading? Do you think you know do in you a mean, couple of years? Do you mean AI trading, like trading AI stocks, or how AI will impact trading? How AI will impact trading? What's well, your opinion on well, this? Well, it's definitely going to impact it somehow. Will it be a, a, an AI robot trading against us or? like a, a futuristic Terminator? Probably not. I feel like mm. the short-term AI will be like an assistant. So, you know, instead of me looking up shelves and stuff, I can just verbally say, hey, this company's here, what kind of shelves do they have? And it can produce information for me on the fly that I can, mm. that I can act on really quickly. I feel that's the first route is assistance. So uh, help human traders. Yeah, help human traders. Like, you know, we sit down and Google something, but now AI could be like, hey, I'm looking at this thing, and maybe it's trained that every time I look at a company, mm. it's going to produce a report that it knows of six metrics. It's going to go to six different news sources and give me everything it knows in a compiled format so I can be like, yes, no, okay. Okay. Ask it more information. I definitely think it's the future. I see it in accounting for sure. Like, you know, just in, in general professional services, just requests, you ask me for something, it can reply. If I have all the information in a file or, a, or, or existing system, then it can put that together for me and give it to you as a client or give it to me if I want it. So that's where I see it going in the short term is being able to compile large amounts of information, summarize, mm -hmm. here you go. Now what are you gonna do with it, right? So. But you, so you don't see it replacing retail trading completely? Uh, well, no, I feel part of real tr retail trading is the the journey or the or acquiring the skill set, right? I feel like it might it might really take over in a lot of you know in a wholesale market. Like I'm sure there's already New York mathematical quant traders using AI to some degree, but I feel like retail traders want to be retail. That's the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to, I mean, there's already bots in place for people that want to trade using bots. But I feel and I'm sure that might exist. But I still feel AI won't be able to. It might be able to handle like EMA bounces or view out bounces, but it won't be able to handle nuances when news hits right away, right? So mm. I feel like short term, it'll be able to produce existing information to you fast, right? And you'll still have to act on it. Like if you are more of a technical trader, using all the yeah. indicators you said, you yeah. think it can help you trade? I, we had this, th this moment in the room, this was probably a year ago, but forget what's happening, but SPY hit like a 200 day EMA on the yearly mm -hmm. and then just start selling off and people were like, I don't know what's happening. This makes no sense. I'm like, it's just quants. It's just it, once in a blue moon, it hits a target against computerized systems and they start selling and it dropped like, I don't know, 10 points really fast. Mm. Uh, so that's what I feel. That's a feel the extent of what quants can do right now is that they can hyper trade in a small zone. Yeah. And then when that t major target gets hit, they, you know, they're looking for it. So they're going to sell into it or buy it up. Uh, but I feel for us, AI is going to help us being like, like an assistant, right? So you won't need Daniel anymore. He'll just be like, AI will be producing all this, uh -huh. all this suggestions <laughs> for you. Sorry, Daniel. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, that's what I think. I think short term will be like, it'll be an, an assistant and a, and a helper mm. in your daily drive, right? Okay. Yeah. Do you think you will trust AI with your money? Like ChatGPT, for example, would you trust it with your money to trade? Uh, I probably would with a, sp a small float. I don't think I'd go all in with, with AI right away. I would definitely test it. Uh -huh. um, you know, I have some YOLO in me. I, I, I'm okay with throwing <laughs> some money at a, an experiment. I've done, you know, I've made, I've made worse decisions with my money on a Sunday than I, uh, than I have during the stock markets. So <laughs> I, that, that implies NFL betting football. Um, but I see. Yeah. <laughs> so 
but um, yeah, generally I would I would I would test things out. Yeah, smaller pool, smaller float, see how it does, um, see how it does during like panic times, right? Because I feel mm. like where AI is going to fail short term until it can master it is when there is a massive news panic flush. Like, you know, when everything's progressing in a range or some sort of mathematical formula, it'll, it, it can do great. But there's mm. always, we have emotion, right? So that's what drives markets. Some, there's lots of fear or greed, whichever way. And um, how it will behave then, right? Is it going to try to short into a parabolic? Is it going to sell out into a flush? Um, is it just going to hold everything and, and then have an error, right? So I definitely would like to test that. Um, small float or on a simulator. Simulator. Uh, that's actually something I didn't talk about, but something I like to do is when I first like get up in the morning, I like to run a sim trade. Like I'll, I'll, I'll look at a stock or, or an ES and I'll run a fake trade just to see, like, 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 war like warming up at the gym, just to see if I can, <laughs> if, I, if my mind's screwed on right and if I'm getting the read, right? Oh, and there's okay. many times I've taken the first trade, I'm like, this is not, yeah, I'm out of here, and I'll leave, right? So Then you're done for the day? Not necessarily done for the day, but maybe I'll come back in half an hour, have some coffee, okay. right? Because there's yeah. times where I'm you like... You need to wake up more. Yeah, sometimes I can tell I'm over eager, right? Like I'll get into a trade, I'll be like, oh, uh, I didn't didn't really wait for my level. Like I was, it's close, but not really. Yeah, okay, I'm over eager. So that's, yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd like to have a warm-up trade, either simulator or like really small size. So that really helps. What advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Uh, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> um, buy Tesla. No, I mean, I, I w I've been trading for a long time. I remember Bitcoin came out. I, I saw it well. It's just that in the early years, it was highly associated with the Silk Road, narcotics trafficking, uh -huh. and illegal activities. I'm like, ah, this Too negative. It was, it was just unclear where it was going to go, right? Okay. Like, at least for me, it was unclear where it was going to go. Maybe I should have paid more attention. Uh, definitely, um, I would definitely say watch your emotions, right? Don't and and take a break when necessary. Definitely don't trade every day. Uh, it's it, we always say it's you know it's hard to say be in it for the long run when you're a day trader because your long run is one p.m. or four p.m. Eastern, mm -hmm. but there is another day to make the money. So if you didn't make the day, take a break. Yeah. You can do it next day or next week. I would definitely tell, say slow down, watch your emotions, and just stick with it. Right, it'll be okay. And what do you have planned next? Like besides trading, running your CPA firm, what else are you? Uh, we're we're, uh, we're launching a little website called Back Office Boys. It's not fully up yet, but it will okay. be soon. We're sort of going to be sort of showcasing what we do in the back office, which is these days it looks like a big tech company with a lot of computer monitors. It'll be us playing with AI, playing with a lot of apps, uh, maybe t talking a little bit of trading because it's happening there while we're there. But uh, it'll be sort of um, a boiler room style of video log and possibly podcast talking about the new apps we're exploring, just shooting the shit. Um, you and, and your friends or? Uh, me and, so I have a series of employees. So I have several okay. employees who are traders and my employees. They tend to, and they're also my friends. They tend uh -huh. to hang out with me and trade and we sort of have a more of a, uh, a podcast style dialogue on the regular and we thought we might just mic, oh. mic up and video up and do it so okay. so it's going to be interesting. it's going to be yeah it's going to be there might be some trading in there cuz you know cuz I we do that daily but there might be some, there some other items about just you know some of my some of my younger guys are single they're talking about girls I'm talking about kids <laughs> right. there's, there's going to be yeah it's going to be like an authentic look at being in an office space yeah where can our audience find you online if they uh, want to get in touch? Instagram, at Martin Delecki CPA is probably the best place. Is where I answer the most uh, DMs. Mm -hmm. And backofficeboys.com, not up yet, but will be up by the time this comes out. So you okay. can put in your email there and we'll be in touch. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chinner. Thank you for That's having me here. Fun. I really had a nice time. Hopefully you guys enjoyed my conversation with Chinner. If you're interested in learning more about tax strategies and money advice for traders, comment down below and let me know. As always, remember to like the video and subscribe to see more episodes like these in the future. Thank you guys so much for watching as always. I'm The Humble Trader and we'll see you guys next time.